Our topic today is God our soul provider, S-O-U-L, or soul provider, S-O-L-E. Had quite a long time. I told somebody this morning I wasn't kidding. I've probably spent a hundred hours praying and thinking about this message. <laughs> Barry has to put up with me in the messages he gets at 6 a.m. because I didn't send them in the middle of the night <laughs> when they came to me. But I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm not going to stop. I'll, I'll never touch all that's on my heart to say to you about this, but I do want to aim this. There's a point that I'm trying to get to in the message this morning. If you don't let God be your soul provider, S-O-U-L, He cannot be your soul provider, S-O-L-E. A lot of people want God to take care of their needs. They want God to, to meet them and heal them and help their families and strengthen their circumstances and show up on their jobs and, and they want God's help in their lives. But I'm here to tell you that if you don't let God supernaturally have your soul, He can't solely be responsible and help you. Jesus said not to worry about things and He seemed to indicate that He didn't. And I don't believe He did. He said the flowers don't toil and the and the, and the birds, they're never, they're never worried. And yet your heavenly Father cares for them. You know, should, shouldn't He care more for you? And He does. And we worry too much. And one of the reasons why we do is that God is not our soul provider. And He wants to be. First question I want to ask you thinking about this together this morning is, what is man? What is man? And I take, you know, there's a lot of, of biblical scholars, most of them that say that man is two parts, soul and body. Now, I take the lesser road. I believe man is three parts. You see, I believe we are a spirit. We have a mind and we live in a body. That's my belief. Why, and I'm not going to get into a bunch of theology, I promise. There's a point to all this. And it's important to you and it's important to me and any child in the kingdom of God to get this. So God created us. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says that God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Well, I told you before, this preacher is Trinitarian. I believe in one God, a monotheistic, in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I believe in one man <laughs> in three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. And that is part of what that means when it says that God created man in his own image. Not all of it, but that's part of it. The other big part is that we're volitional, choosing beings like God is a choosing being. The, uh, the scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7, this is something, that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. I teach my karate students to breathe in through the nose, watch their tummy go out, and out through the mouth. And I've, 
was praying with another one of my young friends who really loves the Lord. And we talked a lot. And I, and I asked him, have you ever thought about that verse where it says that the Lord breathed life into a man through his nostrils? <sighs> All right, this breathing may sound like weird stuff. I'm going to tell you just how strong it is. In the Old Testament, the Jews were afraid to say the name of God. It was called the Tetragrammaton. The closest they came to saying it was Yahweh. But there was no consonant Y. So it was a breathy sound. Yahweh. Yahweh. <laughs> I'm here to tell you something else interesting. In Greek, in the New Testament, there's no consonant J. And so Jesus is not, could not be what they said. It was Jesus. Why would the first consonant or the first pronunciation of the name of God be soft? A lot there. A lot to think about. Why would it be soft? You know, if God wanted to show us who He was, Certainly he could have made a new planet, planet. Or he could have blown up a star or something along those lines. But he didn't do that. He came in a manger. He came in a soft way. He wasn't fighting for our attention. He was coming to show us his true nature, who he really is. And God starts always by showing us his love. The scripture says he stands at the door and knocks. And any man will open the door. He will come into him. Him what? Him is soul. Mark chapter 8 verse 36 says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What is man? Man is a living soul. Well, I was last night. The door, the Lord don't stop revealing to me just because I got to preach in the morning. The Lord got me up last night and said, "Have you ever thought about that with Nicodemus? Where well, I told him he had to be born again? What does that mean? How does that figure into his soul and his spirit?" All I'm going to say is that in those words, Jesus said to us that the most important thing in the world. The most important thing that you can be concerned about, the most important thing in your life is your soul. I'm not going to define everything this morning. I got concepts I'm not even going to mention. I'm still praying about it. I may come back at you. Why is the heart, the soul, so important? Why? You know, part of this breathe, breathe in the Lord Jesus Christ, breathe out the flesh, breathe in the Father, breathe out impurity. You see, the soul is our vital link to God. It's where He comes in and self goes out. You read all about Romans with the struggle of the flesh. Well, the way we win that battle is not by fighting but by submitting, letting the Spirit of God have His own divine way in us. And He never forces it. Never. I have to seek Him. Lord, would You show me a little clearer? Lord, if I open up my heart more, would You, would you share with me? God never knocks the door down. Why is the heart and soul so important? Because it's the vital link between God and man. You see, Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says, For with the heart, by the way, it's used interchangeably with soul, one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth, confessions made unto salvation. It's with your soul that you come to God. That was in, and let's read it in another version. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. It comes in soft. 
But he comes out strong. I'm glad to tell you that Jesus owns me. I'm glad to tell you that I've opened up the softest, tender spot to my heart, to my eternal maker. I trust this eternal one with whom we have to do. I trust the eternal Father, the, the Holy Spirit, and the loving Son of God with anything He wants to do in my life. I'm nothing without Him. But oh, I'm not nothing with Him. Goodness gracious, He says, greater works than these shall you do. And that's what He meant. The Lord wants to be real in us. The Lord wants to be real in me. The Lord wants to be real in you. He wants to manifest Himself through your soul. You see, we take care of the whole man by letting Jesus make us whole. <laughs> you see, Jesus takes all these broken pieces and He wraps them up. He is the potter, as it says in the Old Testament. And we are the clay. And He takes all those pieces and He puts them back together and He makes them into something more wonderful than we were in the beginning. That's why He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you, you need a new start. You don't get it. You need a new spark. A new start. A new spark. A new heart. This Holy Ghost wants to get a hold of the inside of you and love you not like you've never been loved. But you've got to open up and show Him things about yourself you've never shared with a human being. I'm here to sadly say that some of you have things you've never shared with God. And He wants them. The Lord doesn't want anything in front of Him. I was writing a sister last night and we were talking about the Lord doesn't want anything in front of Him. No false idols. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy strength. No other gods before me, says the Lord our God. So is there a difference between the soul and the spirit? I believe there is. I believe it's a big difference. I believe it's huge. And I, I believe I can, in my own mind, set it up so you can see it scripturally. But I can't prove it. You've got to come to your own conclusion about it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Definite separation there. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 What about when Jesus was on the cross? Luke chapter 23 verse 46 And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice He said, Father into my hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. I remember I, I was in Florida with my family in 1998. And I had a premonition, something, get to North Carolina. Her. I got my family and said, let's go. Well, we need to pack back. I said, no, we've got to get in the car. We've got to go. And we drove all night long. And there was no imminent danger to my father or anyone, but somehow I knew I had to get there. And we drove all night long, and I got there at 6 a.m., and, and, and my father was getting up as, as I got there. And I enjoyed a wonderful morning with my father, and he told me things I'll never forget. And at lunch, he fell dead in my son's arms. I remember that my son called me on the intercom from my dad's workshop and said, Dad, come quick. Pop-Pop's falling. And he's, he's not. He said, I don't think he's conscious. And I went out there and I had the false impression that Daddy was still alive because his pacemaker was was beat. And I got down and opened his mouth and performed CPR. And 
the strangest thing I could I could feel pride in my father's eyes that I was trying to bring him back but I felt him back up over my left shoulder Serious. <laughs> I'm trying to bring his body back, but I felt Daddy up there looking at me. You see, he had given up the ghost. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Because it's important that some of the most wonderful supernatural things that God does in you will be done by your spirit, in your spirit. God shows me things in my spirit that my mind will never understand. I've seen things, they're beyond understanding. But I know them. I know them in the depths of my being. God has shown them to me by His Spirit in my spirit. My mind's still trying to figure it out. Yeah. That's why we call him the higher power, right? He knows things we don't. He shows us things we can't figure out without him. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. I remember when my mama died. My brother and I were together. <laughs> and I was thinking it and my brother said it. We were in one of these high multi-story things and he said, there goes mama. And I saw it too. It's a spiritual moment. What it meant, I don't know. So I believe that there is a division of soul and spirit. Okay, now I'm going to again back this up with scripture. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts. See, we make out God to be this, I don't know, sometimes we don't give, we just don't give God enough room in our lives. He wants to plant things supernaturally in your spirit that you've never heard or seen before. There's a scripture that says, for the times I'd rather you be teachers, but you have need of milk. Your babies, you can't handle what's to be fed to the spiritually mature. Open up. Give God your heart. Let Him work on the inside of you. First, He'll show up in your spirit. And then it'll become real in all of your soul. Hebrews 4.12, we just read in the New, uh, New King James Version, says, For the word of God's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. <laughs> I told you I'm strange up. God put his hand on me from as early as I can remember. I tell you, story after story. I was in Montreal. I was 14 years old. I'd been through reform school. I'd met Christ. I, I had given my heart to Christ. I wasn't no easy convert. I fell many times before I got straight. I tell you that. But I was up there and I said, Lord, if you're real, you'll speak to me. And I, nobody was around. You'll speak to me. I want to hear your voice. I won't settle for anything else. If you're real, then you'll speak to me directly. I want to hear your voice. I was walking through a lunch line. I, I literally dropped my tray when I heard the words. Swift is the sword which cometh forth out of my mouth. And while I was scribbling that down, trying to get my wits back about me that God had spoke to me, by the time I got ready to pick back up my tray, then I heard these words, and quick is it to accomplish that which I wish. Swift is the sword which cometh forth out of my mouth, and quick is it to accomplish that which I wish. I'm here to tell you 
It's not. If you're just thinking about this book as words on a page, you're missing it. The words on that page are just where it starts. It's the living tablet inside your heart where he wants to engraft those words and make them real and true and alive in your soul. That's where the life is. Psalms 119 says this. Check this out. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In my heart, in my soul. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. See, if we're gonna if we're gonna take care of our heart and our soul is the most important part of our being, then we need to feed it. That's what we do with the scriptures. Fellowship, prayer, instruction, like you're getting this morning. And we need to work it. We need to exercise it. How do you exercise your heart? And I'm not talking about your physical blood pumping heart. I'm talking about your soul. The seed of your reason. The seed of your emotion. The complex characteristics that make you you. The inside you that I don't see and only God sees. The eternal soul that you are. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. So how do we... First of all, we'll tell you. I'm going to have to come back. I know where I'm going now. Mm. I've got eight sermons wrote. I ain't never going to get to them. The Lord just spoke to me about where I've got to go next week. I'm telling you one way... And I, why do I act nuts asking people to praise the Lord? Why? Because God inhabits the praise of His people. God inhabits the praise of His people when we tell the Lord we love Him and that Savior knows that here's the ones I died on the cross for returning to give me their gift of praise and their, and their sacrifice of praise. It lifts the Father's heart and the eternal union for which we're just seeing the first fruits of begins. <sighs> mm. I want to tell you just a few ways. <laughs> Boy, there's so much I want to do. So much I want to say. Mm. You got to work on mental renewal. You have to have spiritual regeneration. You have to change your behavior. You need your conscience. Reformed. A lot of times our conscience has been seared, flawed, damaged by experiences in life. We need our thought life transformed so that we don't think the same way. We need an internal guidance system that's not just what the world's babbling out there, but it's truly coming from God. We need our subconscious influenced and healed so that what we're dreaming at night is validating and strengthening the things of God. And by the way, the enemy shows up there too. What about him? And we need the Holy Ghost to be our empathic counselor. Why don't I go to a counselor? Because the Holy Ghost is my counselor. And God the Holy Spirit is my deepest eternal friend. I've got some good friends. And God wants to be our definite eternal destiny shaper. We're going to go into praise next week. I didn't know it, but we are. We'll stay away from where I was going. I said, insert Hebrews 13, 15, leave it out. Don't bring it up. <coughs> you see, the deal is, <laughs> I remember, Bert, I, I was talking Wednesday night, I said, it wasn't just Jesus died on that cross. We got to die on that cross with Christ. We got to so identify with the work of the Savior that the Savior doesn't die alone in that tree. That we take this heinous beast, this terrible, awful, fleshly person that would dare crucify the Son of God. And by the way, that's me and you. We put the Son of God 
on that tree. And until we realize it's our place that Jesus took on that cross, we won't understand the meaning of His sacrifice and His atoning death. There's that word. He took our place. But I get to share in His joy. But one of the ways I do that is by letting Him take that old booger, Tim Carter, that put Him on that cross. That old rascal who was about everything but what God wanted. And I get to let the Lord take that old flesh man and put him on that tree and put him in his place so that I no longer serve that selfish son of a gun, but I serve Jesus. He ain't there no more. That old rascal, he took his place on the cross. No longer Paul said, I that lived, but Christ that lives within me. And here's, boy, I want everybody to get this scripture in their mind and their heart. Think about it. Pray about it. Colossians 3, 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Well, my soul's right here in my, my brain. My soul's right here in, in this person. But my spirit's as much with the Lord as it is here. I'll tell you. The Spirit's eternally alive with God. If tomorrow the flesh dies, I'm alive immediately in the Spirit with God. And so are you if you know Him. Does Jesus change us through, through spiritual transformation and mental, emotional renewal? Yes, He does. He gives us that spark in our spirit and He helps us change our mind. I told you, the most important thing in your life, in anybody's life, is their soul. I want to read this verse in several versions. Proverbs 4.23. I may use a version you don't like, but I'm trying to get across the point. You can see the point in every version. Proverbs 4.23, the English Standard Version, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. New Living Translation, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The message says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. CSB says, Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. And last but not least, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. <laughs> People get around me. I, I was a nut, but I'm a Holy Ghost nut now. You can't get a wrong a long Alone, very long without me, without realizing God's real. Because He just spills over. I can't help it. I'm going to tell you about the Lord. <laughs> can't help it, don't want to help it. God's got me. My heart belongs to Jesus. <laughs> and I hope yours does too. Above all else, give God your heart, your soul, your mind. For out it flows all the fullness of life. Everybody's talking about the New Year fitness campaigns. You know, they want to get their body healthy. That's good. That's really good. I propose in Sawyersville that we have a different kind of fitness campaign. I propose in Sawyersville that we get our heart fit. That we get our mind fit. That we get our soul fit. Is God our soul provider? S-O-L-E. That depends. Is He our soul provider? If we want Him to be our complete provider and take care of all of us, then we'll give Him all of ourselves. We'll be like little children like Jesus said. We'll have dependency on Jesus. We'll throw ourselves at Jesus. 
Well, do like the Lord said in Matthew 5, which is, seek ye first. He didn't mean sometimes, part of the time, but all the time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Intimacy begins with utter abandon. Throw yourself away to the Lord. Have no other desire for your life than God's will. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he was giving us an invitation. He was saying, let me have you. I'll be the way inside you. I'm the way. Come on. Oh my. Let's walk this path together. Follow him complete. Let his will be done. Rick, I, I, I know without being there that your message on sanctification was in the amen corner of what I'm saying right now. I guarantee it. Was it? Would it echo what I'm saying this morning? Wesley in holiness and sanctification is about a spiritual takeover. We see all these shows on TV about the transformers and things taking over things. I'm here to tell you that they're all cheap imitations of what God really wants to do inside you and I. He wants to take over our life. And turn us into people who are like Christ because Christ lives in our heart. Must be our hope. Eternal, hope. Eternal focus. If you don't let God be your soul provider, He cannot be your soul provider. So help us, God.